So before we get back to working with the table and lamp and that sort of thing, <coughs> I want to um, make sure that you understand fundamentally how these objects are constructed. Okay? Um, and what I will do, and some of you, if you don't have all of your tools available, it will be, they will be missing here because what we want to do when we select them is be able to add points here. And I don't want to spray points or stipple points, or I don't want random points, I just want points. Okay? And you have to make sure at the bottom you have points selected. Okay? So what we're going to do is I'm going, we're going to construct our own polygon. You need a, a minimum, for, for our purposes, you need a minimum of three points to construct a polygon. Think about, I don't know, how many of you had geometry in high school? Right? You had, you know, you have a single point in space, and then in order to have a line, you need two points in space. But it's still just a line. And then in order to have a plane, you need three points in space. And that's basically what we're going to do is construct three sp points in space. They will be connect. We will connect them, and then you'll be able to see the plane. Then what? I'll, the other thing that I want to do is that once you construct the plane, by default, um, it only. And you may have noticed that, and I think I pointed it out when I deleted some of the polygons. It couldn't see the other side, so that each of these polygons have a side. Okay, so that they can be one-sided or they can be two-sided, and you can choose to do. It can be done a couple of different ways. Okay. Then what I want to do is construct polygons that are greater than three points, which you can do. They can be as many points as they need as, as you want. <coughs> Once you do that, though, one of the things that we will be concerned with are called non-planers. Is it? When you have a polygon constructed of only three points, it's impossible for it to be to, to have a non-planar with that. But think of a stool. You know, you move one leg either way, and it will it'll, it'll never kind of totter. You know, you know how tables and chairs, if they're on an uneven surface, you know, and they have four legs, they tend to teeter totter a little bit because there's always three legs that are that are that can rest on the surface but there's that one that isn't so that would be like a non-planer does that make sense because you want them to be all on the same plane um, if they are not when you go to render um, your your object um, you'll tend to get holes or little fractures and it won't look quite right and there are ways of fixing it but i want to show you what happens you know when you do have non-planers and to be aware of it. For right now, it's probably a non-issue, but later on when we do the reboot character, um, later this week, you will discover that it's easy to develop those if you stretch and distort your, your objects to such a degree that it twists and torques the, um, the planes to such an extent that, you will, that they're no longer flat and they're kind of torqued and tweaked. Okay, so to, to create a uh, polygon, as I said, you need three points. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to select the point tool. And then on the, from the top plane, I'm just going to click once. And then I'm going to hold down the command key or right click and um, click another point and then a third point. Okay. And then I'm done so I can turn off the tool <coughs> and at this at this point in time because all three points are selected I can hit P for poly or at a later date if I choose to you know just leave them as points I can click the, click off them in the lower left hand corner and then when I'm ready to create a polygon once again select them and to select them um, you may have noticed especially when you're in wire view or you know, a wireframe that you click and you hold down the mouse and you drag and then as you drag and do you don't release the mouse, you can select as many points or as many polygons as you like. As soon as you release the mouse, you need to hold down the shift key and then you can select 
or select as many additional points or polygons as you want, depending on what you have selected down here, points or polys. If you wish to deselect a point or a poly, you, you go back over it with the mouse and you click and you drag and notice how it deselects it. Okay, so you might want to practice with that, selecting, deselecting points and polygons. Now that all three are selected, and because I'm only using three points, the order is not important, but you'll see later that it will be important, which or the order that I select them. To turn this into a polygon, because um, if I look at this now, there's just three points in space, if I see this in, in perspective view. But as soon as I hit P, notice that I see a plane now that connects those three dots. If you don't see one from here, what you might want to do is click on the perspective view and look at the underside. And if this is what you're seeing, this should be right because by default, when you're constructing a polygon, it is only one-sided. Yeah. Okay, you have to click the first time, hold down the shift key or, no, not the shift key, the command key, and then click additional points, or just click once and then right click for the second and the third. Sorry, shift key is after you're, you're done. It's, it's command key, the command key, the Apple key. Everybody got that? Okay, so now I have a polygon. And if I go back over here and I deselect, and I wish to not select the points, which I can do, I just want to select a polygon, and I have to make sure that below here, polygons are selected. And you'll see, by default, the whole thing was selected. Notice this little thing that's sticking out from it. If it's not selected, and it looks like this, then just click on it. <coughs> see this little thing sticking out from it? This little dotted line? Anybody know what this is called? It's a surface normal. This tells you the direction that the surface is facing. Now you can clearly see it from here because if we look, as I said, the other side, you can't see it. But um, this tells you, number one, the side that, this, that when you do apply a color, when you apply, apply some sort of texture to it, that this will be the side that will be affected. Later on, yeah. Um, my, uh, we use image render engine, which is for the block. Which, okay, meaning the perspective view? Yeah. You just click from here, mm -hmm. and you're mo can you move it up and down? Your mouse uh, it, it the are you Are you moving the mouse left and right? Uh, if you, if you move it left and right, it will move that way. If you move it forwards and backwards, it should move it that way. If it is locked, let me see. Let me see what's going on here. Oh, okay, yours got twisted too far. In that case, hold down the option key. And then it, instead of using these, we can use key commands to do that. It will allow us to get it reset. Okay. And now we can click from here. If you get too far, you know, kind of a, a skew, then you have to use the key commands for it. So now we can apply a surface to this, and we're good to go. Yeah. The what? The, but just by selecting it, the surface normal? Right. When you select polygons and you select the polygon, it should appear. The entire polygon should be highlighted, the edges, and you should see a surface normal extending from it, only in the perspective view. Well, that's not true. You see it in the back view and this in the wireframe as, as well. See how it sticks out? And it should be perpendicular to it. However, later when we start to apply bump maps and displace, well, bump, bump maps in particular, um, bump maps are a way of changing it, not the geometry, but the appearance of the geometry. And what we're doing is we're just altering the surface normals. And you can, 
make an object, we can, we'll do that today. Look really bumpy and jaggy, like it's made of, of rocks or a bumpy kind of surface. When in, it looks like the geometry has been changed, but in fact, we've just altered the surface normal. So <coughs> it will give us options of, of applying different kinds of surfaces to this object. Okay. Um, to, de to tell whether or not you have any non-planers, we would have to have the polygon statistics up. And when you look down below here, you'll see this little button right here that says non-planers. It's about four from the bottom. And you'll notice that it says there are zero non-planers, which is just what you might think. Okay. And this will become important in a minute. Okay, so I'm going to go back and I'm going to deselect and <coughs> I'm going to do what is called kill the polygon. I don't want to delete the points, I just want to kill the polygon. So to do that, you hit the K key, key on your keyboard, deselect the polygon, hit K, and from the perspective view, it looks like everything is gone. But if you look at your top, back, and right view, you can still see the points. So I killed the polygon, but the points are still there, and that's what I want. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to select points again, <coughs> and I'm going to create one more point out here. Or maybe, how about two points? Why not two points? I'll just do one. That's fine. OK. So I've decided now I want to construct a different kind of plane. <coughs> Not just three points, but four points. Now watch what happens. Just don't follow along, just watch. <coughs> I'm going to go ahead and make sure that points are selected. We'll see how that one is selected. I'll deselect it. And I'm going to do something that's incorrect. I'm going to click this point and drag, select this point and drag, select this point and drag. And then I go to myself, oh, I forgot to select that additional one. So now I'll select this one. I think everything is set. They're all selected. Now I'm ready to hit P for poly. And I look at it and I go, oh my gosh, look what happened here. <coughs> it looks kind of wonky. Does everybody see how strange it looks, especially when you look at the top view, how it's connecting these? Okay, big problem. So when you have greater than three points and you wish to construct a polygon, this is the rule you have to follow. I'm going to go ahead and discovering that I goofed it up, make sure that I have polygons selected. And you can see how messed up it is. And I just hit K for kill. So the polygon is killed. I don't remove the points. What I do now is I switch back to points and I deselect them and I'm going to select them again. But this is what you have to do when you select points. You have to go in a clockwise or counterclockwise fashion. And if you miss one, you've got to deselect and go back and select it. They have to be all selected in order or it won't work. Sometimes when you select them all just by lassoing around them, it will automatically select them in the right order, but not necessarily. And this is what I have to do now. And it doesn't matter which one you start, start with, you just have to once you make a decision to go clockwise or counterclockwise, you have to continue and select them all. And now I can hit P for poly. And now you'll notice it makes kind of a kite-like kite shape so that it's a four-pointed polygon. Okay. And once again, if I look over here and I switch to, po to polygons down below, and I look below here, I have zero non-planers. That's what I want. That's good. So I know that it is an absolute flat plane. I'm going to go ahead and deselect. <coughs> and now I'm going to select points and make sure that all my points are deselected by clicking on, uh, over in the left-hand corner. Now watch what happens. I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to select one point, And I'm going to hit T for move. And from the back or the right view, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to move it up. So now you'll notice I've moved one point in that four-pointed poly. I have moved it up. Okay. 
and I'll go ahead and I'll turn off T for move and I'll deselect. Now watch what happens when I switch back to polygons and I look down here at non-planers. I only have one plane and it shows that I have one non-planer. This is no longer lies in a flat plane so that if you have a polygon that consists of four or more points and you accidentally move one of those points out of that plane, you're going to get this non-planer. By itself, it's probably a non-issue when you go to render it, but when you have a, a model constructed of multiple polygons that consist of four or more points, and if they are not planar, they will not read correctly when you go to render it. You'll get these black holes or you'll get these little it just doesn't read right. Sometimes you'll, it, it looks kind of wonky. Okay. So how do you fix that? The only way you can do that is that you can do what is called triangulate. And what it will do is that if that's what you want, you can see that I had that this plane, actually it will result in two planes at least, but um, that it doesn't lie flat anymore, that it actually looks bent, kind of like a potato chip or that, like that my kite is broken and it's bent up. Well, if I want it to look that way, that's okay, but now you'll see what I have to do. Um, I'm going to hit Shift T, and that stands for triangulate. And now what it's going to do, it's going to take that polygon and it's going to turn it into three-pointed polygons so that I no longer have any non-planers. So I hit Shift T. And you'll see what it did. It actually broke it down into two, two triangles. And now when I look over here in non-planers and it shows that I have none. So that's what you have to do when you have non-planers. That's one of the reasons I like having the statistics, the statistics panel up. Because as I'm building my model, I'm constantly looking for non-planers. Oftentimes when you use primitives, especially when you work with um, primitives that exceed where you add, when we get to it later, when we add geometry to it, they will be four-pointed polys, and if you use the modification tools to stretch it, twist it, and whatever, it's going to torque those, those four-pointed polys and create non-planers from them. And when that happens, in order to get rid of that and to make it the rendering look smooth and continuous, then you're going to have to remove those non-planers by triangulating and hitting Shift T. Okay, it will be really important later on. <coughs> okay, so that that fixes that problem by doing that. But you'll notice when I look at this, it, you'll see that it looks pretty. It's not a smooth or rounded surface. It's just it, it's as if it, it's a piece of paper that's been folded. Okay. So if at any time when you're building a polygon and you want it to be perfectly flat and it g does get out of kilter and you have a non-planer, sometimes it's easier rather than try to move the points and make them all on one plane just to reconstruct the plane because you'll still have that, those little inconsistencies. There are ways of moving them. but make sure that they're perfectly on one plane sometimes can become difficult. Okay. So remember, if you have three points and you move them, it's always on a plane. Because if you just move, it's like you know, a stool. If you move just you know, one, it just still, it doesn't matter where it's moved, it's still on a plane. Any more than that, four points or more, <coughs> if you move one point out of the plane, you'll get non-planers. In order to fix it, you have to hit Shift T Shift T will triangulate and it will convert it into three pointed polygons and you'll remove the non planers. If you don't like any of it, delete it, start over again. Don't try to fix it, don't try to put them all on one plane, it's easier to start again. Okay? Does that sort of make sense? And you should notice now that we should have two polygons. We don't have one, we, it's broken down into two. And with, with now you'll also notice that when I select these, I get two little lines sticking out from here. So that means I have two non, um, two surface normals. You'll have a surface normal for every 
every polygon. Now, what if I decided that I wanted to see the plane not from this side, but this side? <coughs> what I can do is I can flip the surface normals. So if you discover at some point, and this will happen fairly often too, that you know the, the, the polygons are facing, the, the surface normals are facing the wrong way. The polygons are constructed the right way, but really I wanted to see the piece of paper from this side. So how do I do that? Again, with everything selected or nothing selected, it really doesn't matter. You hit F, and F stands for flip, and it flips the surface normals. And so now notice that I can see it from this side, but then when I try to look at it from the top plane, it's missing. To be able to see it from both sides, you have to do one of two things. We've already done it one way when we created the lampshade. Okay, we brought up our surface editor, and since I'm using just the default surface at the moment, remember I selected you could select double sided. That would fix that. The only problem with that is if you use that continuously, is that wherever you use that surface you're going to have two-sided polys. And that can present a problem once in a while when you go to render, render your scene. Because it will render surfaces on the inside and the outside when really you only need the outside rendered. So it will take longer. It, sometimes it will get confused. It's not going to know which side is correct, so it can present problems. So there's a better way. And this does get confusing if you need a polygon that's double-sided. Okay, So this is what you do to create a double-sided polygon. Aside from clicking on the two, you know, double-sided in, in, the, in the surface editor. What I'm going to do is make a copy of this. Let me go ahead and flip this just so we can see the top. To make a copy of it, you hit Command-C, right? Command C for copy. It takes it, it puts it on the clipboard. Now what I can do is I can flip the one that's here, and it's flipped the other way. Now what I can do is hit Command V, and it pastes the one on the clipboard there. So now you'll notice that I see, oh look, at, I have both sides, but in fact I have four polygons. If I look over here, you'll notice that there's four, right? in my polygon statistics. I don't need that many. I only need two. So now what I can do, <coughs> because I know that when I copied this by hitting Command C, it remembered exactly in space where this was. So when I pasted, it put both of these in the same, pl same pl place in space, didn't it? I mean, exactly the same place. So now what I can do is, because I don't need four polygons, I only need two, but they're going to be double-sided, is that I can hit M for merge. So now when I hit M for merge, I get this merge points, and I'm just going to select automatic. It'll say keep one-pointed polygons. We don't have any, but okay, I'll leave it checked. And I click OK, and it says four points eliminated. That's exactly what I want is I'm elimin eliminating half of, half of this, and I click OK. Now you'll notice <coughs> I still have four faces, but I've eliminated half the points. So now I have a double-sided polygon, <coughs> and when I bring up the surface editor again, you can see that I can see both sides, but double-sided is not checked. Does that make sense, what I did? You have to be, to do that efficiently, you have to be very careful how you do that by not moving any of it, by copying what you have, flipping what you have, pasting, and then merging, so that when you paste it, you get exactly the same objects occupying the same place in space. Does that make sense? To, you know, two multiple objects in order to do that. And then when you hit merge, it actually merges the points together and brings it as one. Uh-huh. 
Yes, it will. <coughs> It'll reduce the rendering time. It will make your model more efficient. It will, in, in a variety of ways, it will look better, number one. Um, huh? Yeah, it won't get the little artifact. You can, I guess the best word for it are artifacts. When you have non-planers, you'll have artifacts. When you have double-sided polygons, when you don't need them, um, it will increase render time. And sometimes you'll, you may get artifacts also because it's not going to know sometimes how to properly render it. Because then sometimes when you have polygons that are facing away or inside and it renders them anyway, it's kind of needless. Okay. So what I'm doing, you know, point by point, polygon by polygon, is I'm creating my own object here. And we can, you know, build on this. I could click another point in space. You know, for example, I could go ahead down here. And we'll watch videos later, later on in the semester when we get to organic modeling. And there's a lot of different ways of building organic models. And you can build them point by point, polygon by polygon. It's kind of an old technique. But um, that can be done. Um, I could come down here, for example, select points, and let's um, click another point down here, turn it off. And now let's say, for example, I can go ahead and um, select, let's make, sh make sure that points are selected down here, and click this one. I'm going to hold down the shift key, select this one and this one. So I have three more points selected, and I can hit P for poly, and boom, now I've created and attached another polygon. It looks kind of wonky how I've done it. I don't like it that way, so I'm going to undo that. And I'm going to deselect the points, and instead, let me do it from here. I'm going to select this one first, and so that it looks like I'm actually adding, I'll go ahead and select this one, and then this point, and then this point. Then I'll hit P for poly. Notice how I'm adding, I'm gradually building my own shape, you know, side by side. And then if I want to add another one, I could deselect these, and I can add another one here. So you can just construct your own three-dimensional form, as it were, point by point, polygon by polygon, if you so choose. In most cases, you won't. But it, that is possible. So when you look at these other primitives, whether it be a simple box that's six-sided, it's constructed of six polygons. Each polygon is four, constructed of four points. You see how they're put together, only they're kind of done for you, so to speak. Okay? Does that make sense, what I'm doing here? Okay. I'm going to go ahead and get rid of all this, and I'm going to open up. Actually, I'm going to switch to layout, <coughs> and I'm going to open the files that I created the other day, the table and the lamp, and I also made a floor, and then we're going to light it. Maybe we can put some, a light inside the lamp, and what I want to do is I want to now tweak the surfaces to make everything look a little bit more believable. So it's not going to look perfect, but it will look a lot better than the way it does right now. So what I'll do is go File, and I'm going to go ahead and load, not Scene, but I'm going to load an object because I haven't created a scene yet. And I'm going to go to the desktop because this is where I have mine selected. Yours should be selected or um, saved in your um, flash drive. So I'm going to go ahead and start by loading the floor. Okay. So there's a floor. And we'll load some more objects. So I'm going to go File, Load Object, and I can begin to load all the other objects. So load the table. Oh my, too big, huh? That's OK. The floor can be small. I'll leave the table the size that it is. I'll just stretch the, the floor and make it larger. And once again, I'll go File. I'm going to go ahead and Load, you know, Load Object. And I'm going to load the lamp. This is kind of slow. 
I didn't do it. Did I load the table again? Oh boy, I don't want that because if I move this, I thought maybe I did something. See, I have two tables. That's disaster. So if that happens, because you have two, that will also present a huge problem. If you have two objects occupying the same place at the same time when you render, it's going to look weird, really, really weird. And that was just a mistake. So I'll select this one. And then I can come down here to mod um, what I want to do is I want to just leave items here. And I can delete down below. And while this one is selected, I'll just say delete selected. OK, so that removes it. So let me do it again. File, load object, lamp. There we go. And we'll go ahead and load the lamp. There we go. OK. And I'm going to go ahead and select the um, floor. Floor is selected. I can go to modify. And I can go ahead and resize it. And we can just make this as big as it needs to be. Okay. <coughs> now, the best way to, uh, I think, to get this set up to determine how you want this to look is to start by doing test renders now. And so what I would do is I would first go and select the camera, go to camera properties, and for right now, I do not need any anti-aliasing. It, as soon as you add anti-aliasing, and that we will need that for the final render, but for now, it will speed up the render time, just so I can get a ballpark idea of how this thing is going to look. Okay. The other thing that I want to do is select render, and I want to look at render options. Under re render options, we can enable Viper, which isn't a bad idea. I'm not going to right now. I want to make sure that it ray traces shadows, ray traces transparency, ray traces reflection, and ray traces refraction. Do I have any of those properties there yet? No. But as I add them, and I want to make sure that I see them, then it will. OK? And this can make things look really funky The other, if you don't have them ch checked. Um, in fact, let me go ahead and turn off shadows, and you'll see what I mean. The other thing that you'll want is up here. It says Render Display. Make sure that Render um, or Image Viewer is selected. If it's not selected, you will not have an image to save. So now I'll go ahead and just do a test render. I'm going to go ahead and select Render Frame or F9. And I get that, and you'll see what it looks like. This is the that little frame I was talking about that we want popped up here. That when you don't do that under render options and you don't have this visible, then you won't have an image to save. And you'll, when it is working properly and you have all of the, pro the plugins, notice all the different file formats I can save this as. In this class, you'll want to save it as a Photoshop 24 PSD for yourself. That's a Photoshop document. And you'll also want to save it as a JPEG right up here, LightWave JPEG, and that will be what you email me. Okay? So I can set this over to the side. And remember, <coughs> I said that <coughs> it, when I'm looking at this, and I did this one of the first days of class, I said this final rendering doesn't look anything like what I see here. Because Notice where the camera is. See the little wireframe representation of the camera? This is what is, is actually taking the picture, is this camera. The camera is from this point of view, not from here. Also notice that there are no shadows. That looks kind of wonky, too. So I'm going to go back, <coughs> and I'm going to select Render Options and make sure that Ray Trace Shadows is turned back on. Let's render the frame again. <coughs> and you'll see even with this view, <coughs> notice how the, it, the shadows are now rendered. If shadows early on in your rendering are not important, you're only looking at the, the types of surfaces <coughs> and that sort of thing, it does add time. 
so maybe you want that turned off. But remember to turn it on, turn those features on at the very end, or it will look strange. Shadows help anchor objects in space. Um, if you've, how many of you have had traditional drawing classes? Anybody? A Co couple of you? Yeah, well, that shadows are really, really important when you draw, aren't they? You eliminate shadows, and they look like they're floating in space. The shadows will also help define the form, make it look three-dimensional and round. Shadows are really, really important. Okay. So now we have this one that does have shadows. So now the first thing that I want to do so that I can get a better view of this is maybe move the camera around. I can move the camera around from here but it might be easier if I switch from perspective to camera view. So now I'm actually looking right through the camera. I also have another view that I can use later on. When I want to point lights at something, I can also view it through the light. So I can look at light view. This is the direction that the light is shining from. So I can see if the light is pointing at what I want it to illuminate. This is not what will be rendered. I'm just looking through the light as if I were, what are the guys in theater, guys in film called that handle lights? Lighting technical specialists? I don't know. There's some probably special name. This is if you were right up there in the light, looking down, seeing what it's pointing at. That's what you get to do. So I'm going to switch back to camera view. And now I can make sure that camera is selected below, and I can move the camera. <clears throat> I can look at it from a worm's eye view. I can look at it so that I'm actually standing, looking down on it. That might be not a bad idea, and I can move it around. So I leave all of these elements in place intact, and I only move the camera. That's probably the best way to work. Don't move the objects around to fit the camera. Just move the camera. That would be like going into this room and saying, you know what, this isn't really the way I want it. Instead of me taking my camera and moving myself to the other end of the room, I stay, stand put and I have somebody move all the elements around in the room to fit the way I want it to look. It doesn't make sense, does it? It's easier just to move to the other end of the room. So what I can do is I can hit the same, it's the same key command, it's T for move and make sure that camera is selected below. Maybe I'll move a little bit over to the left. <clears throat> and if I want to move the camera up, I have to hold down the command key and I click and drag and push it up. If I want to rotate the camera, you can, if you forget the settings, you can also go to modify or the key commands, you can also go to modify. And you'll see that you have rotate, move, you have all the same modify tools that we will have in Modeler. So if I hit Y <coughs> for rotate, now I can rotate the camera and I look down. Notice I'm looking at it not from a three-quarter view, but at least I can see all four legs. I can see the top. I can see all the planes. It looks pretty good. Maybe it should be moved over just a little bit more. So I can hit T again, move this over just a little bit. Hit Y for rotating the camera, and we'll rotate like so. So I like the perspective. I don't like how the floor is situated because it's cut off back here. But I can always go ahead and turn off. I want to hit move. Actually, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to go back and I'm going to, what am I going to do? I'm going to select the floor. Table is selected. So I'm going to select the floor from using the little panel at the bottom. Select size, and I'm going to make it even bigger. OK, so it's a table in the middle of my room. Now what we can do is we can start <coughs> from top to bottom, or from bottom to top, and we can begin to refine the surfaces, can't we, to make them look a little bit more believable. Um, Let's start from the top and work our way down. So I'm going to go ahead and, and hide this temporarily, put it down here in the dock. And I'm going to bring up the surface editor in here. Okay, so let's start with the lamp. So I have the lamp shade. 
And let's look at the properties of the lampshade at the moment. It's just kind of a, a beige color, isn't it? But you'll notice in the basic properties, there's, there's all sorts of things that we can change in here. What I want to do <coughs> is I want to add transparency and translucency to this. And later on, I will add some luminosity, and I'll explain later what that means. But think about the actual properties that the surface has. Lampshades allow light to penetrate it, don't they? Like, so that you don't see the light bulb, but light can pass through the surface, can it? So that means it's translucent. If I could see the light bulb through it, it would be transparent. So let's go ahead and add translucency, and let's use the spinner here to really crank that up. And you can see that as soon as I change the properties of it, I see in the preview here something changing. It's going to actually show, you know, change, show me how the properties of the surface are going to change. To make this even more apparent, make this look more like a lampshade, I should probably do something. I should put a light bulb in it, shouldn't I? Now, I already have a preset light in here. It happens to be what is called a distant light, which is equivalent to adding a sun. I want to put a light in here. So I can do that. I can go back to items, and you'll notice that there's a place here. It says add. I can add null objects, which we'll get to later. I can add another camera. I can add dynamic objects, all sorts of stuff. I'm going to add a light. And you can see all the different lights that we have here. The kind of light that I want to add would be a point light. It's a little ball of light. And we'll call it light bulb. <clears throat> now notice where it puts it. It puts it right at zero, zero, zero on the floor. <clears throat> Again, in order to accurately place this, I should probably have a different view of this. <clears throat> I can move it so that it fits up in here, like so. But I don't know for sure if this is actually in the lampshade. I mean, I do because I know where it placed it, place it at zero, zero, zero. But it, this could very well sit behind the lampshade, couldn't it? So I might also, instead of camera view, want to look at this from my top view. And I can see it's placed directly over there. Okay. So let's go back to camera view. Now let's go ahead and render this again and see how this has changed it at all. So I'm going to go ahead and render frame. Let's go to here. Let's go to items. I want to make sure that I have everything that I want here. Select render, and then we can render frame. Let's see how it begins to look. Notice how the lighting is starting to affect things and how it's starting to change properties of everything. Notice that how this is illuminated around here, and I see a sh uh, uh, two shadows. I see one cast by the table, and this is coming from the lampshade, the light from the lampshade. And notice how the shadow is cast back here from the light that's back up here that's the default light. I can eliminate that light later on if I want. <coughs> but also notice <coughs> that the lampshade does not look like it's bright, like a light would be. I mean, if there were light inside there, it would look pretty intense, wouldn't it? I think it looked like it would be illuminated from within. In order to get that feature, I'm going to add something called luminosity. So I'm going to go ahead over here, bring up my surface editor, and we're going to add luminosity to this. And it's going to, it, it does not actually emanate light, but it looks like it glows. It looks like light is shining from within. So we're creating an, the illusion that there, I mean, there is a light in there, but it doesn't like the surface until we add luminosity to it. So I'm going to go ahead and add that property. Crank that up quite a bit, and that looks pretty intense. So now when I render this frame again, now it looks more like it looks bright. Maybe a little bit too much. Maybe I need to crank that down, just to turn it down a little bit. Instead of 
maybe turn this down to uh, maybe 30, no, a little bit more, 40. I want to leave it at maybe 50 for right now and leave it at that. <coughs> okay. So I sort of have the lampshade done. Now let's go to move to the base and let's decide what kind of properties the base has. Maybe I want it to look like it's ceramic. Maybe I want it to look that it's ha that um, it has so a slightly kind of bumpy, shiny surface or something. I don't know. Um, I can come back here and begin to tweak some of these properties that I have here or what I can do. <clears throat> what I want to see is if I look under window, I want to see something called presets. And if all of yours are here, and let's hope that they are, there should be a whole slew of them here. We have cell colors, we have color, the, the standard colors, we have some fabrics, generic glass, metal, nature, organic, rock, all kinds of stuff here. Strange textures. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to look, let's look at something organic and see what we have here. Some pretty strange ones. Golden hair, what do I have? Skin, nope, I don't want any of these. How about nature? Let's see what we have in here. Underwater, green moss, tangled vines, hemp. Coarse sand, we've got all kinds of stuff here. Let's look under. Oh, let's just try strange, what the heck. Disco ripples, we've got all kinds of weird things. Lizard skin, brains. We've got some pretty strange ones here. Some pretty cool ones too, though. Uh, I don't see anything we want at the moment. My suggestion is to explore some of these. There are some really neat ones that later on when we get to surfacing, um, We'll want to um, deconstruct. I like this burgundy one. So I'm going to make the base of my lamp this burgundy texture. It's not quite the way I want it, but I like it. So how do you take one from here and replace it over here? First, you have to make sure that you have the correct surface selected. So I have the, my lamp base. Now what I'm going to do is double click on burgundy. It says load settings. What it does is it does not change the name of the surface, but it does load all of the settings of that surface and replace what I have set for my lamp base. The only thing I had set for my lamp base happens to be a color. And you do have to be very careful when you do this because it's not something you can undo. So if you're, if what will happen is if you can work hours on a surface and if you're not careful you can stomp on it and it goes away and you can't hit undo and fix it. That's one of the few things that you can't undo. We can, if you're when we get to it on another time, on another day, when we get to surfaces, there are ways of saving the surface and putting it in your workspace or creating your own custom little library of surfaces that will be useful to you so that you can save them for another day. So I'm going to go ahead and load the settings and notice how it loads it in here. Now it will, when we look here, replace it, but notice it doesn't show all of these interesting little diffused textures and these little things in OpenGL, it just doesn't show it that way. You're not going to see the finished product until you use Viper or until you render it. So maybe once again, I should go ahead over here and I should go ahead and render the scene real quick. And you'll notice how the base has changed. 
And we, we begin to see that it looks a little different now. Notice how it's starting, it has some of those reflective properties. I can also check and I can, even though I've loaded that default setting, I can come back over here with lamp base. And you'll notice that it's added specularity, it's added some glossiness, some reflect, no reflection, we could add reflection later on. If we want it transparent, we could make it that. We can do all sorts of stuff to this. Okay. So I have my lamp base done. If I wanted to change the color of this, maybe I don't like the brown, but I like the other properties. You'll notice over here, too, there are these little T's for texture and for specularity that have been added. If I click here, you'll see that they added a gradient map to this, and they've added some tur tur turbulence. This is where you get this little kind of vein-like ripply effect. If I want to change the color of this, just click here, and let's let's make this more on the violet, the blue violet side. Okay. okay, so I've got that. That didn't help me much. So let's go back in here. That's because I have. Oh, shoot! I got to change it from here. Sorry, I'd have to change the gradient map. So that doesn't help me at all. Never mind. And I'm not going to spend the time to change the gradient map. It takes too much time right now. So it didn't change it. Never mind. Um, let's just leave it. I'm going to go now. I'm going to select the table. Hit the little twirly. Let's start with the tabletop. And maybe I'll add, make this look like it's made of glass. So you'll see up here we have some glass textures. Maybe I want it to look a little bit kind of like smoky glass. Maybe there's one here, down here that I like. And I double click. And I add the settings. And I move this and you'll see that it looks transparent now. And let's go ahead and render it again. Let's render and see what we get. So now you can actually see through the table and you'll notice how it's affecting the shadows and everything else that we've done in here. Okay. Maybe I can make the legs look like they're metal. So I have more of a contemporary table and I have a glass top and I have chrome legs. So I can come back once again and let's um, select from our surface editor. Let me close this. Let's look at what we have here. Okay. And let's select table legs. Let's come back over here and let's look at metal. Let's see what we have here. Um, we have silver stainless. We can make it stainless steel legs. How about some chrome legs? Chrome would be good, but it's probably not going to look like chrome. And I'll tell you why. Is that in order, when you begin to add reflective surfaces, they need something to reflect. Okay, but I'll go ahead and add it anyway to show you. And the reason, and you can see the preview here, it looks pretty matte, doesn't it? The reason it looks matte is that the majority of our environment is just black nothingness. And that's what it's reflecting. So one of the things we can do, um, and we'll do more of this later, is to, is to tweak this and to create a false environment or an, an illusion of environment. So what I can do here is, instead of basic settings, you'll notice here that reflection is set to 75%, so it's very reflective surface. I can click environment, and what I'm gonna do is I want to add something called a reflection map. And what that will do is it, in, because even though that there's nothing in the, my environment, what it will do is it will reflect what I have in that map creating the illusion that there is an environment being reflected out here. So what I'll do is I'll load the image, and I'm going to go back out, and you'll find later on this semester that there are tons of images in here that will be very useful for you to, um, that are part of uh, the old classic um, New Tech library. If I click back on the Macintosh hard drive, go into Applications, scroll down to 
New Tech 8, or whatever it is, LightWave 8, and I look in the content, its content folder, and I look in classic content, and I look in images, what I want to do is scroll down, and I want to see there should be reflections. And you'll see Chrome. Let's try this one. Uh, that's not what I want. Doesn't help me. Um, ray tracing and backdrop, I just want spherical map. This is what it should look like now. Because I can control um, whether I, if it's the backdrop only, which is nothing, then adding this environment doesn't help. If I select ray tracing and backdrop, it really doesn't help. Okay. What I want is I want it to only see what is in the ray tracing and the spherical map. Now it should more like, look more like Chrome when I'm done. So I'm going to go ahead and render the frame. And let's see. And now it looks really reflective. Notice that, that it's reflecting the yellow ground environment. It's reflecting um, also the illusion that there's a nice environment here. Look at here. When in fact there's nothing but black. See how it looks like I have nice chrome legs here? And now let's change one final property. <coughs> let's change the floor and make it look a little bit more interesting. Select the floor and let's find some unique surface that we have here. Let's look in organic again. No. Let's look in rocks. We could apply a marble surface or red stone wall. We could put that. Look like it's on a rocky surface on a brick surface. Yeah, let's go ahead and add bricks. Want bricks? What kind of floor do you want? We could add grass, make it look like it's on lava rock, and all kinds of stuff. Um, space, space textures, strain textures, let's go back to here. No, don't like those. Fabric, glass, metal, nature. What do we have in here? We have a grass, sort of. We have bumpy mud. Mystic grass. Dry lake bed. Let's go ahead and have it sit on a dry lake bed. There we go. Uh, cracks and all. <coughs> Let's go ahead and render the frame again. Notice how the reflections change. Look at the size, the scale of the cracks. Pretty large, aren't they? That's not what I wanted. Just way too big. Okay, the, the, the glass looks really good. The chrome looks really good. The floor looks very strange. Those are the biggest cracks and the biggest tiles and stuff I've ever seen. It looks really bizarre. So what we can do is we can come over here to our surface, look at basic, and what we're going to do down here is where it has, we have a bump map here, and we have a color map. You'll see where the T's are for textures. I'm going to click here, and they've added a gradient here for the bump. Okay, I'm going to close that. I want to change the size of the bump. And you'll see here that we have the veins, which are important. And we also have um, the multifractal pattern. The multifractal pattern I like. It looks pretty good. The veins are too big. So what I can do is I can change the scale of this. And they're set at 200 millimeters. Um, I probably want a tenth of that size. So I'm going to go ahead and select each of these to maybe 20 millimeters. Let's try it again and let's see what we get. You'll notice in the preview it looks very different now. It looks almost speckly and like... A, 
this is based on a one meter preview. So now I'll re-render again. And that's not what I want either. I changed it too much. Well, actually, it's not bad. No, it looks good. Never mind. I was looking at the preview down here. So now I have it sitting on a, a nice crackly kind of mud surface. Kind of funky looking, huh? But I'm getting there. Now if I want to make it look like it's been lighted, not with an external light, but the light from the lamp, I will remove that. Or I will turn it down. I can create some mood, you know, mood that way or whatever. So I need to go back, and that'll probably be one of the last things that I do now, <clears throat> um, so that you can actually see more that the light will be, you know, that, that's affecting this environment comes from the, the light that's inside the lampshade. I need to come back to my scene, and let's go ahead and let's look at the items in it. And I'm going to select down here, not light bulb, but light. Okay, notice the items down here, you can select objects, you can select bones if you're adding bones, you can add <coughs> lights, and you can select cameras. Remember, you can have multiple lights, multiple cameras, multiple objects, and whatever bones you have selected. I'm going to select lights, make sure that I select the default light, and I'm going to come up here and say clear selected. And it should just clear the main light. And notice that everything gets much darker because I have a whole bunch that's been, you know, of light that's been that's been removed from my scene now. So watch now when I render this. Let's click back on render and render frame. Now it looks that we have like we have a a table and a lamp in a darkened room. And this looks like it's like a 60, 100 watt bulb that's rendering this thing, doesn't it? Th that's um, lighting this scene. So this looks more like if we were in, if we turned off all the lights and had no other, nothing in here, we ha except a table and a single light, what it would look like. So now I can abort this. And what did I do with it? There it is. So now you can see. This looks a bit more the way it would if this were alone in a room, nothing else. It's lighting, you know, this whole scene is being lighted by this single light bulb here. Now, there's other things that I could do. What if I wanted to see, um, no, never mind. There's other things that I can do with lights that are pretty cool. <clears throat> I could come back and probably make the lamp shade look a little bit nicer. The lamp base doesn't look that spectacular when you see that it's being lighted only by this light source. But it's okay. But you can see in a very short time how you transform this just to plain ordinary objects so that they actually look like something now. Just by adding some of these default surfaces, changing some lighting, and voila, boom, you've got something pretty incredible. Okay. That's pretty much probably all that I wanted to do with my lecture today. But what I can do is after I turn off the video camera is if you want me to go over any of that again, you can see how I did it. Um, I can do that. Because what I want you to do is to finish up the table, the lamp, and add a floor, and then take it over to layout, play with some of the preset surfaces. Apply the surfaces, make sure that they fit the object. And if it looks wonky, it looks wonky. I want you to experiment a little bit. You're not going to be able to do you know, wonders with it. But, and then render it, save the rendering, and then email me the JPEG. What I want to do this Wednesday is I want to start the reboot character so that we can move on with more tools, more techniques of building 
and we'll do something a little bit more complex. And we'll, but this time, we're going to build it together. Okay. Actually, the last thing that I would want to do in here, I did forget something. If I was really happy with this, and I said, this is what I want, okay? This is the you know what I want rendered. There's one final thing that I need to do. I still see the jaggies here. Remember how I turned off anti-aliasing from the camera at the very beginning? I said I didn't want it on because that speeds up render time. It does fewer passes. When I'm happy, if I'm happy with this and I want you know a picture perfect final rendering, I'm going to turn up anti-aliasing. So what I need to do now is select cameras properties and where it says anti-alias in here we can go to three passes maybe five passes typically are more than enough if you're accustomed to the old way of doing it enhance low is actually pretty good for this one later on this semester for some of your other projects classic medium is about as high as you would want to go and that should be about five eh, is it five or nine passes I can't remember I don't want to go that high. I just want to go enhance low. And I'll re render it again. And you'll notice some subtle changes in here, especially where there are any curved surfaces or diagonals. You'll no longer see the jaggies. <coughs> so I'll go ahead and um, render. We're going to render frame again. <coughs> it takes just a few more seconds. Five passes is what it's going to do. That's pass one of five. 205. And it was, notice how it takes a little bit longer, but the results are much, much different, especially when you, when you print it out. It will look really, really different. And remember, you can change the surfaces at any time. I can take any of the objects and I can. <coughs> take them back over to modeler and I can change the you know the, the actual physical construction of them at any time I can tweak the proportions in here instead of a, a little square table what if I want an oblong table what if I wanted a bigger table if I want to duplicate the table you can always do that it's nothing is ever you know that permanent notice how those jaggies are now gone Now, if I turn transparency up too much in the lampshade, you see through, and you'll see that there's no light bulb in there. You'll see that there are no attachments to attach that, the shade to the base. And you wouldn't see that anyway, you know, if you're looking at a lampshade. It's only translucent. I could probably turn up the luminosity a little bit, but not that much. I wouldn't need to. Um, in this class, only build what you're going to see. If you're not going to see it, don't, you know, treat it almost like theater, like um, film. You know, when you, uh, has anybody ever gone on the, the tour at Universal and they take you down the old west or those streets that they have? There's nothing behind it. There's just the front. Well, if you're not going to, if you're not going to take the camera around the back, no point in building it. So a lot of what we do will be illusion. A lot of what we do will be, no, you need to see the whole thing. When we build the toy, you know, we'll want to be able to see it from any angle. You know, that's the advantage of working in 3D as opposed to Illustrator or Photoshop. In Illustrator, you draw something and you finalize your, your illustration. Um, and someone says, that looks great, but I'd like to see it from the other side or I'd like to see it from the back. You go, oh man, that's a whole new drawing, right? It would take you the same amount of time. In 3D, all you have to do is come back in, move the camera, or add a camera from a different perspective, take another snapshot of it, maybe change your lighting a little bit, and you've got another, you know, a, a, a whole, totally different image. Very nice. That's, what, that's one of the real strengths of working in here. It does take time to get everything set up initially, but once it's done, You've got, you know, something really nifty. Okay, I'm going to turn off my camera, and if you want me to review any of this or go over it again, I will be more than happy to.
just that I don't want to run out of um, video. To, well, there's no tape in here, but you get the idea. <laughs>